Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, this week is a perfect representation of the fact that I'm moving in a direction with this show where I'm I'm not necessarily just looking to talk to people about stoicism, but I'm looking to talk to anybody who can give me a unique life experience that can teach me and you guys something about how to live a better life. And uh, so we've got some really interesting perspectives on this week, starting with my guest today, Jeff Bosley. Now, uh, I came across Jeff uh, actually in the Facebook group, The Practical Stoic Mastermind, because he's a member in there and he's been uh, chatting for a while with some people in there and offering his perspectives and um, a really interesting guy uh, based out of California uh, in the Hollywood acting industry. So, uh, really interesting perspective there and I'm going to tell you a little bit about him and then we'll jump into the episode as well. And just so you know, you can find all of the links to where you can find uh, Jeff Bosley online in the show notes as well. So, so Jeff Bosley is a film and television actor with an extensive background and training originating on the stage where he was nominated and won many awards and accolades, including the Theatre Recognition Award, the Theatre Service Award, and two nominations for Best Actor. His current work and projects have earned him major roles, transporting him to international movie sets and Cannes Film Festival screenings. Proud theatre geek, turned Army Special Forces Green Beret, turned Medal of Valor earning firefighter and now back to actor, Jeff has utilised every ounce of life experience he can, which translates to all that he does on screen and as an actor, and behind the camera as a director and producer. So, such an interesting perspective that we get to hear today, and uh, he's been studying Stoicism for a while now as well, and so he brings that into the mix, and, and man, we just talk about so many fascinating elements of his life and uh, and so much great stuff in here which we can all take away and use for our own lives. So without any further ado, I present to you my guest today, Jeff Bosley. All right, so we're here with none other than Jeff Bosley. Now, uh, Jeff, how this came to be, I was basically going through my the Practical Stoic Mastermind. I know you're a, group, a member on there on Facebook. Um, and you've contributed a bit in, in, the, in the group as well. And um, I took a look and I said, hang on, this guy's doing acting. He's, you know, he's involved in all sorts of really interesting things and he's involved with stoicism. Why not have a conversation? Because, um, you know, as a creative myself, you know, musician, and I'm really interested in, in not simply learning from people who are talking about philosophy, but also just people who are uh, pursuing really interesting things in life and how they use stoicism. Yeah. So... I'm going to let you introduce yourself to everyone and then we can jump into a thrilling conversation. Awesome. Uh, well, yeah, in short, my name is Jeff Bosley. I'm here in Los Angeles right now. Uh, my E! True Hollywood story short version is I was raised in Idaho. Uh, my dad was a, an ER physician. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. Dad's, dad was raised by like a Nebraska dirt farmer. And um, so small town existence, grew up. Did some college, went off and did crazy stuff in the military, dabbled in firefighting, and then a lifelong childhood practical dream was playing around in Hollywood. And finally, through various circumstances, I made that, took the risk and moved here and have been doing that ever since. And that's... Yeah. That's the short version. <laughs> that's awesome. I, I love it. It's the, uh, you know, the small town guy comes to the big town of Hollywood. That's a classic exactly. story, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I always joke that if the 18 year old Jeff came to Los Angeles, he, he'd be, you know, curled up in a position, sucking his thumb crying. You know? so <laughs> I'm glad I've lived the life I had because yeah, this is a ruthless world and a ruthless industry. And it's nice to numb it down a little bit for sure. Yeah. Now I want to talk about a lot of that, but what interests me at the moment is uh, growing up in Idaho. What do you think, what do you think that experience, uh, how do you think that that led to the creation of Jeff Bosley? <laughs> um, brilliant question. Um, 
it's interesting because my parents, you know, it's you, you, your nature versus nurture. I was raised around academia and an emergency room physician and his brothers are all elite surgeons and they're, you know, and it's, it's like, it wasn't like, Hey, be a doctor, but it was, there was this, it was this weird duality of do anything you want to be, but I can't imagine anything of that that you want to be being impractical. Like there was like that subtext. Yeah. And uh, my mother um, is very artistic. Um, and she, she very much was, you know, she, if she wanted, if I was learning to draw, she would push to draw and all that. But inherently I'm very type A, very controlling, very practical. That'll probably be a word I'll beat to death in this conversation. And so that, that was the thing that nature and nurture constantly uh, worked on and helped grow and breed. And then, uh, and that's, that's kind of what brought me here today. You know, my dad doesn't, I don't care. I mean, unfortunately, some people have horrible childhoods and, and I'm very fortunate. I had a great childhood. My dad, despite being an, you know, a physician was very um, pragmatic and very diligent with our money. I, I say this story all the time, but like if I always wanted the really expensive um, air, you know, Michael Jordan tennis shoes, he gave me like 20 bucks. I had to figure out how to make the difference, you know? Mm. So that kind of attitude and his upbringing kind of brought me to where I am. Like I, there wasn't a huge military background in our family, but for whatever reason, whatever they cultivated made me go do these things that were scary and intimidating and extremely hard to do. Not because they specifically said, Hey, Jeff, go be a green beret or Hey, Jeff, go be an actor. But whatever they, the seed they planted allowed me to believe I could do something so asinine <laughs> with my life yeah. and, and do it without hesitation, you know? And so that's, my parents got me where I am and they don't give themselves enough credit for sure. Yeah. No, the, and there's such a, there's such an important, uh, well, there's an importance to uh, that kind of parenting that says, listen, I'll give you a little bit, but you've got to figure out a few things for yourself. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. How, how, do, how important do you think that was for you in terms of giving you independence? Uh, I mean, it was really important and it's because yeah, they were all for independent thought and doing, you know, what you want to do. And it's ironic, it wasn't, you know, when I sat him down, I remember explicitly the conversation in the course of probably a 24 hour period, I made a decision to join the military and go do, like I explicitly wanted to do the special forces thing. You know, I didn't want to be a cook. So poor mother, and I was in my 30, almost in my 30s at this point. So my mom thought I was safe at that point. And they're, you know, they're, my little boy, nothing's going to happen. And I remember explicitly, I enlisted in the military and proposed to my girlfriend, like in the same 24 hour span. And I sat down with my parents and I told them, hey, I'm going to go try and do the special forces thing. And they were all for independent thought until I told them I was going to try to be a Green Beret. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait, you know, you're, are you insane? And then that, you know, that ran its course. And then I went to try to do the Hollywood thing. And then they're like, you know what, this Green Beret thing looks pretty good in comparison. <laughs> so they're all for that independent thought once they, but it was leave it to me growing up. And I'm sure if they, when they see this or listen to this, they'll say, we were all for that independent thought and, and being your own identity, but you know, good Lord, Jeff, why did you have to swing to the fence on all that independent thought? You know, I'm sure every day they're like, why couldn't you just be a teacher? Or why couldn't you be mm -hmm. something very practical? You know, even firefighting, they were like, Jeff, can you please just get a desk job? <laughs> yeah. You know, but at the end of the day, every time those conversations, you know, they weren't perfect, but they always were very, always were very um supportive of independence and that thought mm. despite I, i'm not a parent but despite what it's like being a parent i can't fathom what i put them through <laughs> so yeah. uh, i'm sure it took a lot of work for them to to be allowed be okay with that you know and support it mm. yeah and and there's such a it's so important to have people in your life who will scrutinize everything that you do uh yeah. you know not that they were always scrutinizing but it's important to have people who are going to say well are you really sure that that's the right path because yeah. either that yeah. will tell you uh okay it's definitely not the right path or you'll yeah. say it definitely is now my job is to prove that it is the right yeah. path right? yeah well i was just listening to one of your older shows and i can't remember the, the gentleman's name but it said it's nice to have people call you on your on your bs you know yeah. and it's it's hard to have it's I, 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 you ever go through something and you look back and you're like, why didn't my friends say this? And then they're like, well, it's because you seemed happy and you, you know, we care about you. And you're like, no, why didn't you stop me? You know, and I can't, yeah. have, I've never been on the reciprocating side of that equation where 
would I say something, you know, like, would I taint my support or would I say, you're being an idiot, stop, you know? Yeah, and so yeah. God help parents out there listening. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know how they walk that tightrope. That's, that's terrifying yeah. to me. It, it is. It's, it's difficult. And, um, you know, I, I think that we're getting more and more into a culture where, um, you know, parents are, I think they're less likely to, uh, encourage their children to take bigger risks or to, to actually go out there and be extremely independent, like go outside, spend time outside, yeah. you know? And, and I, th I think it has to do with the fact that there might not necessarily be more violence or more failure or more anything yeah. in the world, but we yeah. see more of it because of the online world that we, we have. I right? agree. I can, I will, I would take that to the grave. I, in a heartbeat, I, I grew up with the very cliche come back when the sun sets uh, yeah. upbringing you know, and, you know, it's not like there are 30 people. I think our city had like 67,000 people. So it's not small, but yeah, it was, if I think about how it is now, if I had kids right now that disappeared for 16 hours without a cell phone or without any sort of communication, that makes my, that just makes my gut sink. And I think yeah. there's that fine line of locking it down because of the social media or because of the news bombardment, but also letting them be kids because I wouldn't say my parents were ignorant but they might not have been aware of the horrendous things in the world. And now yeah. that's all we're bombarded with. And so, mm. you know, I always joke, my sister has kids and she's younger. And I always just say to my friends and everybody that is of this generation of, you know, I'm like, good luck with your kids. Cause I, I don't have the answer, you know, kids with <laughs> cell phones and kids with the internet. And like, you know, I'm, I, I'm of the generation where there's the slight transition where I knew what it was like, it's almost like BC and, you know, BC and AD. It's like pre-internet after internet. I know it was like beforehand and it's like during, but this next generation, all they'll know are iPads in their cribs. You know, that's their norm. You know, yeah. selfies will be from day zero for these kids and, and I got help them. <laughs> that's yeah, all I it's, got. <laughs> it's so difficult to know how to navigate it. Right. Cause there's just yeah. so many unprecedented yeah. um, things going on in the world at the moment. Um, you know, let alone yeah. what we're dealing with right now, but exactly. uh, we're in a completely different time. And, and that's why I'm so excited about, um, you know, segueing into stoicism yeah. and everything. I think that, that, this philosophy is having such a resurgence because we're dealing with so many different situations and we yeah. need something to cling on to, to let us know what's real and what's not. Right? I would hundred percent agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I so think, why don't we, I think, sorry, yeah, go for it. Yeah. I, I go for it. Well, I was just going to say, I'd love to kind of move through, you know, you, I know you're a firefighter as well and, and, yeah. and in the military, like I want to talk about actually, why don't we just start here? When did yeah. you first get into stoicism? Was it before the military? Was it after? Oh, yeah. And then how did it help if, if it was before with yeah. the military and fire? Um, formally, as far as like, I'm aware I'm reading a book on stoicism or I'm listening to stoic podcasts, etc. It wasn't until probably formally a year plus ago, just yeah. if, if that, you know, um, but it's, I've even just preparing for this today, I was reading up on some stuff just to kind of make sure I got all my uh, ducks in a row. And ironically, I would say in the military, I was practicing it, but wasn't aware of it. And mm. I'm sure, you know, I think she's on your show, Nancy um, Sherman. Yeah. I think that's yeah. where I came across an article she wrote. And that's what, and that this was like just over a year ago ish. And I went, holy crap, this is what I've been, this is what I did in the military. And I, it's, it's, I don't want to say it was easier, but it's things were less bombarded. We didn't have coronavirus. We, I wasn't surrounded by news cycles of, murder and you know rape and pillaging and all that mm. and so it was, it was easier quote unquote to apply stoic things because there were the ingredients of all the diversity and chaos was lessened in the military yeah. even though it was chaos but there you know i mean i had to worry about like seven things in my life i did yeah. have bill bills or as i didn't have to worry about bills on my cell phone when i was deployed or materialism and all the things that helped stoicism stay that in that yeah. neutral space but yeah, so I wish I would have heard it before then. I, I'd be very curious how it would have enhanced it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't until about a year ago, and it's it's not a moment too 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 soon. <laughs> yeah, well, to, let, talk talk about your time in the military. Then I'd really yeah. like to know about that. So you, you're a Green Beret. You're deployed. Yeah. Um, what what did that whole experience teach you about what it means to be a human? Yeah. Um, well, a, a Green Beret. Um, for clarity, so just because it's it's got a 
ironically, of, uh, in my current profession, ironically, the motto of Green Berets is quiet professional, yet it's also mm-hmm. something I use for marketing purposes. So it's this yeah. huge uh, um, <laughs> hypocrisy there. But essentially, it's people liking them to Navy SEALs or the Australian SAS. So it was a very yeah. intense existence. Um, and I think that world, because uh, everything was at an 11 there. So I think, in like I look back stoically, retroactively, you kind of didn't have a choice. You didn't get to ease into anything. You know, you didn't get to dilly dally on your decisions. Uh, you had to be very stoic in everything you did, not because you read a book on stoicism, but because things were so black and white with very little shades of gray, you know? And I mean, like you would, the life of that kind of military, you triaged, not in the sense of where the term comes from medically, that applied to, sadly, but you triaged what really, really, really mattered. And it was a, it was a ruthless triaging of what mattered. You know, you instantly forget about that cell phone bill your wife didn't pay in Colorado when you're in a firefight in Afghanistan. You mm. very quickly forget about material things. So it, that existence, and again, I'm not knocking any job in the military, but that existence was much, you know, in the barometer of military experiences. Here, you know, here would be a cook or something, not knocking being a cook, and then here would be my existence. So I, you didn't have a choice other than to think stoically. And I would mm-hmm. dare to say a lot of people I know, the person that posted the stoic, some stoic meme that eventually made me kind of go down a rabbit hole about a year ago, he's a, he was actually another Green Beret. And I would bet money that military people drift towards stoicism, you know, after the fact very quickly because it's inherently something we did. And mm. um, I, I, I know like, like I'm actually going to, I just got uh, Nancy's book on Kindle. I'd be very curious. I think the last time I read her article, they're actually trying to push it in military education. And I think yeah. that'd be priceless, uh, you know, not just at the officer level. So. That was a mm. that was a very convoluted answer, but yeah. No, no, it makes sense, and you know, I, I think I, I was talking about this with uh, one of my clients the other day. We were talking about discipline and how uh, yeah. you know, there's a difference between the discipline that you get from a drill sergeant yelling at you, yeah. and the discipline you get from working on it yourself and just doing it because it's the right thing to do, right? Like. Exactly. Discipline is, and, and virtue is doing something for that something's sake, right? Whereas yeah, exactly. uh, you might say that the drill sergeant is forcing you to do something, therefore it's not necessarily 100% virtuous. Did you notice yeah. people in, mil- in the military who, you know, when the drill sergeant's yelling at them, they're doing everything right. But then as soon as they have to, you know, go home, it's yeah. just like straight back yeah. to old habits. Yeah, well, that's the one I'm, I'm going to get crucified for not remembering this phrase, but... um it's something like integrity is doing what doing the right thing when nobody's looking, you know? Yeah. And, um, I had a unique experience going to the military cause I was almost in my thirties. So I already kind of, I mean, I was, my frontal lobe was pretty much hardwired at that point. You know, I was kind of set in my ways. So mm-hmm. I had a unique perspective on that. And I would see exactly what you're saying is I'd, I was older than my drill sergeant and I would see kids they're fighting every step of the way and it's volunteer service. And I'd, I'd sit there and I genuinely had like almost like studies in the human condition. I'd be sitting there in the middle of this misery going, why is this guy fighting this? He asked to be here. Not like it's always fun and, you know, roses and mm. happiness. And I would see that and wonder why that, but then I would look back a little bit more maturely and realize that there's a method to the madness where, you know, discipline begets desire. And I would see that they would force that, that temperance or that courage, or they would force the concept of those things, thus creating a foundation for them to kind of like cleanse their palate to train for lack of better terms, that, that reactionary process, you know, obviously some people can't be trained and then maybe they don't make it. And those might be also the people that are the bad, you know, the couple bad apples in the basket, unfortunately, but there's not many of them, but yeah, that drill sergeant thing. I mean, they're not saying, you know, nowadays I can't speak because it's been a while, but they're not saying, hey, do you want to be disciplined today or do you want to do these push ups? You know, they're saying you will do this and you will be disciplined. Mm. And hopefully that taps into something. Some people, obviously, as you and I know, in, in any field, uh, some people are inherently that's their nature to be intensely disciplined. But with that, 
ironically come, you know, it goes to that, the, the um, dichotomy concept. I'm one of those people that hates when things don't go my way though. So I'm extremely disciplined, but if something comes out of the left field, then I'm, I, I, that just ruins my whole day. And so the military would also tap into that where I'm like, Oh, cool. I know exactly how things are going to go. And then they, the drill sergeants would mess with my world. And mm. I, as Jeff had to learn how all that stuff is great and dandy, but if something comes out of the left field that you can't control, you are, you know, we, the mil, there's a military phrase that's beat to death all the time is adapt and overcome. And yeah. that was my thing for, you know, the undisciplined kid, he had to learn discipline. I had to learn how to flex my discipline. And it, it's, it's an ironic design. I, I want, I want to know who the mastermind is or if they really truly have a plan sometimes because it's, it works out, but it's, it's amazing that it does. Yeah. Now I've been thinking about that lately because, and this, this might be an interesting angle that you could teach us about. I've always considered that, uh, the military would be such a great career. Um, if only for, you know, five, six, seven years or something like yeah. that yeah. as a way of, uh, of really doing something that would be meaningful, that would create something of you. Right. Cause there's, yeah. there's nothing quite as reassuring as being around somebody or talking to somebody who, who has seen the things yeah. that you might've seen yeah. as, as a yeah. green beret, right? It's like, yeah. it, it makes you a different person. Yeah. But one thing I've always considered is, is, you know, it's kind of a young man's game, right? But you got into oh, yeah. it when you were 30. Yeah. What, yeah. what would the, not that that's not young, but, but that's older than the average, right? So not what 18, would the yeah. benefits and the, and the, um, I guess the, Drawbacks. What, what, what was the yeah what yeah. was it about being 30 that made it either good or bad to be in there at that time yeah i think well like i said what you were kind of touching on is it's a, i'd be curious about the study of it because you know you can go on to other countries where they require service for two years you know etc mm. um and uh you know not not in an elite not even to get political or an elitist military i'm never going to be the if people don't serve i'm not a judgmental former serviceman i don't teach their own that's why we're free um but i do have a, what you said is i'm very curious as to how you know god forbid somebody gets hurt or you know killed in the line of service so discarding that i'm curious how it can hurt you know i'm, I'm slightly ignorant as far as like well what's the argument for how it's going to hurt you you know everything from education to habits and discipline and and i do think that that does like you said create the commonality forever. You know, I can meet, I'll keep using a cook and I don't mean a derogatory, but I actually, when I was a firefighter, I met a cook that was, was in the fire, to, uh, fire academy with me and we instantly bonded. He was a Marine. I was in the army and we had no history together. And we, within a couple of seconds, we instantly knew each other's jokes, the habits, the mannerisms, you know, inside jokes. And that's, that, that was a huge morale booster for us. And it was instantly, and it, it was amazing. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be always curious because that goes back to like, what's that movie? Um, Starship Troopers. <laughs> like the only way you can like <laughs> vote is to serve, you know, and that could, that's a slippery slope. Um, but mm. for me, the age thing, it was hard because physically just, I was old. I'd lived a pretty good life of rodeo and football and soccer, both. both Wait, versions. pause. You did rodeo? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're going to have to jump like. into that. Yeah. <laughs> As I'm wearing a Wrangler shirt. Um, yeah, I, I grew up, we had, it was, this is the little side note is you always see those movies where there's like the two rival high schools. I, my town at the time was small enough that there were only two high schools. And during the football season, which coincides with rodeo season, they'd be rivals on a Friday night, but their rodeo teams weren't big enough. And then Saturday night they had to, merged together as the one rodeo team and and work together against other cities and so yeah I, I didn't do anything too phenomenal i didn't get on bulls because i think that's insane I, I did the one where you jump off the horse and wrestle the steer to the ground yeah uh, so i mean i didn't live a boring life so i was pretty beat up physically when i went in uh so that sucked a little bit as far as just doing that. And like I said, I was kind of set in my ways. I was kind of wired as an adult, you know, my, I was done forming in my lobes, but so that made the, somebody telling me what to do hard for me, you know, it wasn't like it was going to make me quit, but I definitely had to come out of that. I mean, you do anything for 30 years, a set way. And then somebody says, no, you're doing it this way. That's hard. That's kind of a yeah. shock, you know? So that was hard for me. That was my learning curve. But as far as the benefit is is i saw the way i'm wired 
I saw the, a lot of the reasons why I saw the game. I, you know, I didn't, if the 18 year old Jeff was getting yelled at by a drill sergeant, I would puff my chest out and go, this is a man competition and that's it. You know, the mm. 28, nine, 30 year old Jeff realized that there was a purpose behind it, even though it sucked. I saw the reasoning, you know, I was literally more mature. And so yeah. that helped, you know, it is, is it, I was, I was mentally hardwired, but physically a little afraid. <laughs> and yeah. eventually those worked out together down the, down the line. And um, I wouldn't have done it any other way. I don't think. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Well, you mentioned, you know, you kind of knew the rules of the game, right? I think, I really yeah. think that that's the purpose of, of studying philosophy as well. It's like, I agree. it's, yeah. it, it helps us to learn the rules of these games in life and how they yeah. affect us. And yeah. it also helps us to pick the right kinds of games, right? Yeah. Um, and I want to jump into that later, but I quickly want to yeah. ask you that moment before you jump off the horse onto the steer and yeah. wrestle it to the ground, yeah. that to many people, well, to probably 99% of people <laughs> would be the most horrifying thing ever. Firstly, you have to uh, have cognitive ability enough to ride a horse yeah. Um, and you have to use the lasso. No, yeah. this is, this is the one where you would actually, um, you'd start on the horse and there'd, there'd be a steer. So like a teenage yeah. bull in the shoot next to it and they break out, you'd ride next to him and you literally, it's called steer wrestling. You literally lean off the horse, put him. it's, this is very, a lot of animal lovers will hate it. I I'm amazed it's still a thing anymore, to be honest, <laughs> but you put him in a headlock, they outweigh you. So they're going to they don't get hurt, but you put them in a headlock. Basically you leave your horse completely and you have to twist it in a certain way that all four of their legs come off the ground and then the time ends. So mm -hmm. there's no ropes. It's just you, you, it's for lack of a better literal phrasing. You are wrestling a steer to the ground. Yeah. Jumping yeah. off of a moving horse and a good time is doing it in less than four seconds. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just everything about rodeo is amazes me that it's, it's a thing, you know, but what's, what's the cognitive process there? Like, what does it feel like in your mind the moment you're about to jump off? And <laughs> it's, it's, I think, and I, again, I'm not like one of those, I'm not an extreme sports guy. I get, I, I do have the bug, you know, like I do miss, mm. I think some people are wired certain ways. Some people are wired that way till the day they die. You know, let's like, be honest. You did rodeo, you did the military. Yeah, and I, you have, were I have the bug. You've got but the bug. Now, yeah, I have the bug, but I think it's even the bugs a little old, but like, I don't, uh, I haven't enough, but at the same time, it wasn't like, I was like, it, it was, the, it was more of a sport to me than like a guy that jumps off of cliffs. Yeah. So, it, but it was a sport. There was a rush, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't playing pool, you know, I'm highly aware of that, you know, and I think anybody that, the, the cognitive process for me, it just tapped into that, that competitive nature of, I need to do this in less than four seconds. Yeah. And, and it's just like with any sport, there's a certain sound or a certain feel, and especially in rodeo, there's certain smells and it just is all enveloping that makes you go, that just makes everything turn off, which is kind mm -hmm. of, again, I mean, it all kind of comes back to this ironically of that nothing matters in a good way. Mm. You know, all the sounds are drowned out. I always use a cell phone bill metaphor. I didn't have a cell phone at the time, but um, you don't think about your cell phone bill. You know, yeah. all that matters is this one thing. And it's, it's a silly thing in, in the grand scheme of things, but it's a nice, it's all that matters. And yeah. it's a rush yeah. at the end of the, I mean, you deal, you, that endor, there's a dump of endorphins and adrenaline and it's fun. And if you really screw up, there's a lot of endorphins yeah. and, and uh, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I got the chills just thinking about it because it is fun. It was fun. <laughs> if I did it now, though, I'd probably walk funny for a week, you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, I think what you're tapping into there is almost like the flow state, right? Which is yeah. really that state Perfect. when it's, it's on the, the precipice of, of risk and reward, right? You know it's exactly. risky that if you don't yeah. do it right, you know, yeah, not that this is nearly the same sort of risk, but um, even myself and, and most jazz musicians, when we're improvising on stage, you yeah. know, there's that feeling that you're not thinking about anything because you've yeah. already done all the practice, right? Yeah. So you don't need to think about things. You simply just need to totally. be there yeah. and you don't even necessarily focus on anything. You're just trying to sound yeah. the best, but you don't even think yeah. about it, right? Well, and I, not to pitch you, but I actually just listened to the one podcast where you'd mentioned about how I can't forgive me. I think you said it might've been Miles Davis where he said, great improv is something like just keeping your catching a screw up and recovering basically or whatever yeah, yeah. you quoted it much more eloquently than me 
and yeah, there's that, the risk of error is, is always there, you know, like mm. if and that's what I think drives people, I, I wouldn't, I'd say anything, whether it's improv and in music, music, or even improv, like live theater is way different than recording a movie on a nice digital yeah. camera, you know, race car driving is different than taking an Uber in a urban street in Idaho. You know, yeah, that, that yeah. there's just that, like you said, that risk reward thing. And some people tap into that in various ways and some people just don't. And it's, we all walk, I think some of those who tap into a certain way, you know, have a limp for a metaphorical and literal limp for life as a result. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think once you experience it, I think you can experience it in so many different, whether it's sports yeah. or endeavors yeah. or um, music or anything that you're doing where it requires almost a hundred percent concentration, but you, st but what you realize when you look back at it is that 100% concentration almost isn't even uh, a possibility. And once yeah. you realize, and this is what the Taoists taught us, like once you realize that you can't do it, yeah. that's when you can do it. Right. Like once you yeah. come to yep. the point where you're just like, there's no way I can get out yeah. of this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the rodeo is an interesting one. Hey, cause I, you know, I grew up on a farm as well. And you know, I, I every year we'd go to the Nambour, you know, our local town yeah. rodeo and it was great. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we, my wife is from Texas. So when I went to Texas a few times, oh, <laughs> obviously we had to go to the big American rodeo. And I tell you yeah. what, I, I'm so easily sucked into patriotism because they were doing fireworks and, oh, yeah. and, and the cowboys were coming out there. I was in tears. It was yeah. great, right? Yeah, that's but, the epitome <laughs> of patriotism is a rodeo is. in Texas. You can't, you can't make it any different. It's the most <laughs> America you can get, right? And, um, and you know, to extend an olive branch to people out there as well, like I also agree. I, I, like, I think, I think it, th there's got to be an element of, you know, how good is this for the animals? It's not great. Yeah. But on the other side, what people don't realize when they don't grow up on a farm is that it's very difficult to hurt a cow. It's very oh God, easy yes. for a cow to hurt you. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. It, it, it definitely does, uh, not to get too deep into various events. In my event, um, if bull riding is a little not cool, or there's some tying involved that is not cool on the bull. But yeah, at the end of the day, those animals will kick your butt you you will yeah. lose every fight and and they you know and now ironically i would say i would bet that because there are so many uh organizations to probably police that i would imagine things are that much more safe yeah. because if it still As exists it should be you know exactly you know everything grows and evolves i always i don't know if you remember i know i'm your senior by a little bit but that restaurant chain jack in the box like there was this huge mm. e coli scare when i think i was in junior high and everybody was terrified to go to Jack in the Box. But after the fact, I was like, this is probably the safest burger joint to go to now because they are yeah. terrified to screw it up. So I think Rodeo now, they're like, it's a, you know, like I don't agree with like the circus at all. That's just horrendous. But yeah, growing up on a farm, you'll realize those animals will kick your butt. You know, you will yeah. lose. <laughs> There's, there are some, yeah, it's, it's, it's nature and nurture and nature wins in that one for sure. <laughs> Every time. Uh, as you see in rodeos, probably all the time, right? Yeah. Um, but I want to jump uh, forward now into yeah. your career as, as an actor, right? Because I'm, yeah. I'm very interested in how you use stoicism to, I, I guess I could start with here. How, how, do you, how do you stay grounded in what is often seen as one of the most toxic cities? <laughs> no, like, and you, yeah, you can speak completely un or candidly, and I probably will agree with everything you say. Yeah. Um, it's like, I, the thing I will, I guess, precurse all this with is I've found that that rush literally or metaphorically of whether it be steer wrestling or jumping out of a helicopter or whatever, I get that when I get a chance to act or actually not to be mm -hmm. all lovey dovey, but when I get to do things like these kids organizations I work with, that is now my new rush. And so that's, I guess that's kind of almost my disclaimer because I know, like you said, it's a very toxic industry. It's a very toxic in the city. It has a lot of rightfully so negative connotations. And so I almost want to disclaim it. So people know I'm not like, I'm just here for Ferraris and cocaine. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not here for that. I, I, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, like, yeah, I love doing things with kids. I love having the financial freedom. If it gets to that level of being able to do stuff, help, you know, without kind of personal financial consequence. But yeah, so with all that being said, I find now stoicism 
just even today and yesterday when I was really playing a lot of catch up, stoicism was easier in the military because it was much more black. It was like a one-to-one ratio. Hmm. Stoicism is way more important to me now in this toxic, chaos, chaotic city because, because, because of all the negative things or all the bad things. It's just, it's, it's a hyper saturation of all, all good and bad. You know, you can, people can be millionaires. People can be, you know, living in their car. I think it's one of the few industries that's so extreme. And, yeah. and the reason I kind of swung into stoicism and why I'm embracing it daily in this city is because I'm inherently a person that is used to, like, I put in this work, I get this reward. You know, it's that's you know, I, my dad went to medical school, he became a doctor. You know, I know you did a fitness stuff. So you do that, you go to your courses, you get your license, you know, mm. pretty black and white. Here, I could put in 200% effort and never get a 0% in return. And so I lean on stoicism constantly because that is, to me, the epitome is the what's in my control, what's not. And, and mm. the city, you know, it is that can go down very, I, I, I risk saying toxic avenues in your mind and spirit and body and all that because it is as humans, we that not having that reward or that gratification, you definitely need to lean on something to ground yourself on it, especially if you're constantly not getting anything out of all your work. Um, and, mm. and yeah, it's, it, and I run, and I think coming from those worlds like military, I think I'm inherently more of a military guy. It's, I'm a weird, I'm my own like dichotomy in that I'm very militant, but I also love art. You know, it's those things normally yeah. aren't, they're not normally in the same Swiss army knife, you know, and, and I, I definitely in that, this city where I have no control over it, I can't tell people what to do. Like when I was a sergeant in telling, you know, I, I don't, there's that, this is the most opposite existence <laughs> I could have picked compared to where I was good, you know, or what I was better or more comfortable or natural in. And so, hmm. yeah, that's, it, it's hard. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's not a day goes by where I don't think of, the dichotomy of control, like day in and day out, you know, day yeah. in and day out. Who do you think are examples within the industry of people who are doing it right? As in people who aren't yeah. simply just going after that fancy car, but they're doing it in yeah. a meaningful way that's helping others. And I think, and actually um, I might've been the same podcast I was listening to the other day where you, you got, you guys had mentioned something about where it's easy for any of the Stoics or they, the, if any of the Stoics were alive today, they wouldn't be able to give us advice because they don't, you said something back that you don't, they don't know us. They don't know our life and all that. Yeah. And I look at, to answer your question, it's the bigger and, and more known people get, it feels like the less connection I have, you know, yeah. um, like I, I, I can look at the biggest movie star in the world right now. That's in every movie under the sun. And I can hear every story about how he clawed his way up and he had only a couple bucks in his pocket. And those are great now, but now he's so extreme that I now have lost, I don't feel that connection that, you know, whether it's a kid wanting to be a great basketball player or a great musician, when that gap gets so great, you lose connection for inspiration, you know? And so like, I, I you know, you log those away and it's great and all, but it's, I'm to the point now where I look at how they, like to answer, to, to use the same question you're asking me as I look at what they're doing currently, you know, cause if I'm looking at people like me, I, it's the cities is so full of extremes. So like, I always just use, I beat to death the example, like to me, like huge, your, your, your country's huge Ackman. I think he's an amazing, mm. he's always kind. He seems great with all his charities and he always just, he works hard and he's always worked hard. And so I always look at that as far as, they seem nice. They seem to match the career I want. They seem to not be, like you said, chasing down Ferraris and wealth, even though he has that kind of wealth. And so I use like, I create kind of a parallel goal. So like I always use Hugh Jackman because he has a great career. He has a career. I'd like to have a comparable one. You know, you can play Wolverine and a, a music, in a music, you know, a musical. So I always look at him at that as far as, and I liken him. One of the things that has overlapped stoicism with me is I, I really actively try to do well with meditation as far as like transcendental meditation. Mm. And I actually met him through that. He actually is very avid or at big advocate of transcendental meditation. And it was really cool to see him stop and, and kind of 
but you know turn off that static of the world which is very it was very stoic of of him to do mm -hmm. and the more i look at that the more i like well that's my goal as far as the weird thing about this industry is i look at it like if i wanted to be a green beret i wouldn't look at the guy that just started his military career like me because we're on the same page that doesn't make sense to me i would just look yeah. at the end, end result and just look for green beret that was good at what he did you know but this industry is hard because the like i said that gap gets so huge i don't i don't relate mm. to the rock anymore you know yeah we're in lockdown and i'm lifting rubber bands and my dog for exercise and he has a gym that travels the country with him yeah you know his story is great his career is awesome i teach their own but i don't relate to the guy it's just yeah. i don't like you guys made a comment about you know, inspirational posts and all that stuff and i can't take it anymore you know not in a negative way it's just you kind of you lose who you're drawn to you know it's it's, yeah. it's your childhood heroes are normally a little bit more tangible you know they become yeah. godlike like almost too too godlike that you are they're un unattainable mm. yeah. and you almost have to have to pick closer ideals right people who are closer exactly. to you yeah and 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 I think that that's that's also the necessary way that we should do it, even psychologically. Because when you pick an ideal that is so far out that it's unattainable, there's a, okay, there's a certain value to that, and I've, I've, I I continue to teach that there is a value to that because because you need to realize that that even though it's so far out, that doesn't mean yeah. that you shouldn't go after it, right? You should still yeah. try that. But yeah. in terms of practicality it helps to have people who are closer to you along every step of that journey. Um, yeah. And the yeah, reason it, it makes sense to me is because when you, when you reach out to, so, you know, obviously having a podcast, I reach out to people all the time. I'm yeah. um, trying to get them on the show, but if they don't respond to me, I completely understand why they don't respond to me because could you imagine being somebody like the rock, for example, yeah. and having, you know, thousands of emails every yeah. year from people wanting to wanting things from you. It's like Marcus yeah. Aurelius taught, right? There's always more people wanting something from me. Yeah, exactly. Brilliant. And, and, and you kind of have to recognize, okay, they're in that position. They've done what they've done to get there. Uh, maybe I just need to pick people who are closer to me and yeah. kind of work my way up and, and not yeah. necessarily expect anything from them. Yeah. Right? Yeah, well, and it's, it's, I mean, just to paint a cinematic, simple picture, you know, if, if the Roman emperor is up in his balcony watching the, the fights and you got to get a message to him, you're not just going to yell, like, hey, everybody stop and listen to me. It's just, yeah. it's, it's, it's so extreme that it, it becomes unattainable. And it's, I also like, I always forget about this one when I was re-homeworking up today was the, the, I don't know if it's a principle or a pillar where it talks about like, think of the negative potential, like, you yeah. know, not being yeah, negative um, visualization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The negative visualization. Thank you. Like I always find that intriguingly applicable here because like that slippery slope of like, Oh, I want to visualize and be like Hugh Jackman's career. But the negative visualization side of it keeps you from letting that bad day in the city drown you out you know like if you come into the city and i have some real some of my closest like i kind of feel like a big brother to them that if they if and when they move to la i want to just like put them under my their wing or under my wing and go you're gonna be crushed <laughs> like, i'm just yeah. gonna like, i want to like i don't want to be jaded but i like that negative visualization thing i'm gonna, like swing for the fences but just because you strike out don't let that have you like because you got to come in here with an 11 but that means you're up here and so when something goes wrong that's a high fall so just yeah. be aware that a fall can happen because like you said, psychologically, if you're not ready for that fall via negative visualization or whatever, it, it hurts your soul. I mean, I don't care yeah. if you're some badass green beret, a musician or artistic actor that, you know, failure quote unquote hurts, you know, if, if there's something you want. So yeah. swinging for the fences is good, but you're also, you know, if, if nobody swung for the fences, people wouldn't, you know, the rock wouldn't be the rock, you know, cars mm -hmm. wouldn't have been invented. You know, people had to do absurd stuff, but you know, it's, it's, here's where I'm glad I'm not a parent. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd be, well, like, I'd be like, go work in an office. That's, we, you can do that. <laughs> That's a fact. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that there's, there's, I don't think that there's anything wrong with telling people you should pick the most, the most insane, crazy ideal that you want to work towards. Right. Yeah. But like you say, you need to recognize that you don't start there. You need to, yeah. you need to, you will be crushed if you want to yeah. achieve that. It will be the yeah. most difficult thing you need yeah. to, you ever do. Yeah. Right. 
but as long as you don't expect it to be anything other than what it is, it yeah. will be the most meaningful thing yeah. you ever do, even if you yeah. don't achieve that. Yeah. And I know that, you know, your industry is particularly uh, flaunt with, with, with failure, with, yeah. with a rejection. Right. And yeah. I mean, I, I even remember, I, th I think recently you posted something about, you know, just as you were about to get the, almost the audition of your dreams, right? Yeah. Coronavirus comes Coronavirus. along and they've got to cancel it, right? Yeah. No, I didn't know. Well, yeah. like, That's Hollywood, yeah. right? So yeah. What's the, yeah. psychologically, how important is it for you to recognize that you will always have failures along the way, but you've just got to keep on going with the process? For me, it's extremely important because of uh, the last, sounds like uh, this last probably year and a half or two years coincided with when I came into stoicism, just when life, just whatever happened happened in my life and brain um i i know i'm very susceptible to um win at all costs not you know I, i'll always say i'm never malicious to anybody i'll never stab anybody in the back nothing like that but i'm extremely self-competitive and extremely excuse me very relentless and i'm highly aware aware like i'll use a a, a metaphor like mount everest to go with art what you're saying is you know that thing's giant, and if you, the higher that is, the hard, when you fall, the further that fall is. And you have to, you're an idiot to not think that, that can't happen. You're not being smart about your pursuit if you don't take into consideration the negative visualization. And I'm highly aware, and the older, the wiser I get, or whatever you want to call it, that I, as Jeff, am extremely competitive. I hate, I hate the these, I would I use the sentence I hate because that's not very, con, you know, therapeutic or conducive to positive pursuits. So I really don't like losing or, you know, or like I look at, and I know like in, the, in a, on a bad day, if you will, somebody and I, we're in the same audition room. We, you know, Hollywood is just full of clones. Like if you want, if you have a certain type you want to date, just go out to an audition that day for that type. And you can just kind of <laughs> pick it's, it's the most, it's almost like a Saturday Night Live skit. You know, it's like, Oh, like even if you don't know which room you're going to for the audition, Oh, just go down that hallway with the guys with muscles and tattoos. And that's, you know, that's where mine's probably at. And, yeah. And, and so the way I'm wired is if it, to me, I don't want to hurt any of those people. Nothing like that absurd. But to me, every one of those people, as much because this is such a dream of mine, they are an obstacle. Not so much like I, uh, I need to overcome, but they are potentially taking away my job. And not like mm. literally my, I mean, yeah, it puts food on my table, but they could take away a thing that take, goes towards my dream. Whereas like in a sport, it's kind of black and white. You have more points, you win, I have more points, I win. So that that is why, the way I know I'm wired is why I know I pay highly pay so much more attention to being so cognitive of the stoic approach to it. And I'm not good at it at all, but I'm being, I guess, kind of the first step is admitting it, if you will. So the first step is being, I, I've become aware of what, you know, you always use the traffic analogy about, you know, what do you have control or what you don't. And I'm, I'm the guy, I'm like, I will find a way to control traffic. <laughs> and yeah. I know that's absurd. That's just stupid. And so I'm, I'm, the way I'm wired because of just the life I've lived and the way, I, you know, for lack of better extremes, I was in life and death circumstances where I could control it, where, you know, it was very extreme and intense and, and very kind of gritty black and white. And that worked for me and I'm aware of that. And so I need to filter that through the stoic approach of everything that's absurd with this industry in the city. And like you said, I actually, I did get the audition of a lifetime had it submitted it we're done and now industry shut down and that's out of my control <laughs> <laughs> you know and 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 i and no joke since this has happened i go back to the, that stoic principle probably the minute i wake up to the minute i go to sleep because yeah um, yeah because there's so much going on and i think i i mean obviously i i pimp stoicism but i think that not like an alcoholic, but admitting the problem is like the biggest step. So like for me, where I'm at in my stoic journey is being aware of the application of these things is the biggest thing for me and being aware of your deficiencies when applying it to whatever industry or world you're in. Some industries are a little, or some existences, firefighting was pretty easy for me. It was very nine to five, white picket fence, two and a, two and a quarter kids and that whole statistical normalcy. Um, and that'd be a little bit easier to apply it to. So. I think people need to be aware of 
kind of not aware of their failures, or, but their weaknesses or their things they need to better themselves on, you know, like when it comes into where do, what key point of stoicism it matters most, you know, for, you know, like I'm okay with materialism. Like I slip into it just as much as any American, but as far as control, that's where the, that's the feature I'm always focusing on is, is yeah. to be better at that. You know? Yeah. I'm over here. I'm looking over here at like my notes. <laughs> I'm yeah, not like no, that's absolutely I'm not fine. over here. <laughs> hey, you can control that. That's fine. Um, <laughs> I think I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to talk about you're somebody who I see as, as a perfect example of following your unique nature as a human being, right? Because yeah. you've picked things that you wanted to do and yeah. you just went out there and did them regardless yeah. of the risk. Right. Yeah. And I, I, something that I want to bring to the canon of Stoic thought is, mm -hmm. is that Stoicism has no place in telling you what career to choose at all yeah. or what yeah. career is good and what career is bad. Yeah. Stoicism's place is to tell you if you're going to pick that career, you pick the correct games within that career, you pick yeah. the right aims within that career, and then you'll yeah. be so much more effective and I you'll agree. also, you'll, you'll help more people uh, to do the same. Yeah. So, I'd love to know from you why to you is acting in theater so yeah. important uh, in, in culture or, or in the world? Yeah. Uh, well, and I think, again, this is just all great coincidences, you know, like where it talks about Stoicism talks about the returning to nature and all that. And I think you, you guys have talked about it at one point, like that can be highly mistrans uh, mistranslated to where well, you're only supposed to be farmers. You know, it's like, well, yeah. take it down a notch. It's 2020, you know, things have changed. Yeah. But I think like everything with this industry is extremes, you know, and, and I'm, I would just bet my life statistically, there are people that come into it for the money and women and cars and houses and all that. And it's a, I imagine it's a slippery slope. I won't lie. Like there are jobs where I've had a couple of jobs where I'm like, Holy crap. I can't believe they just paid me this stupid, I mean, money to do something so trivial, you know, yeah. trivial, loosely speaking. Um, and so I can see how if you're wired a certain way, if you're young or immature, whatever, you're like, this is the best thing ever, Ferraris and cocaine. You know, I always use that joke. And it's just, yeah. I see if, if you have a weak foundation, it, it can be dangerous. But for me, I look at it and I've been kind of retroact retroactively applying stoicism to it. I mean, ironically, this is happening during the, the, the uh, coronavirus lockdown. And I, I mean, I even posted a meme today that I stole from somebody about like, wow, if, if you've never wondered what artists do, I'm not ne de de uh, negating healthcare workers right now. That's goes without saying, but if you, on the other side of the fence, if you've ever questioned about movies or TV or art or free podcasts, what are we all doing 24 hours a day? Like I, I, I'm a pretty active guy, but I almost feel like one of the laziest pieces of crap. Like it's like, Oh, I better get dressed today for Simon. You know, <laughs> like I haven't been <laughs> dressed for a week, but I, we've all been watching Netflix or Amazon, you know, and, and, now, ironically, I wouldn't have had this answer for your question until this happened, where this is why. And I, I've said this, the following, I've read, uh, an acting class or a professor of mine made me write down, like, essentially, why do you want to be an actor? And I wrote it down much more eloquently. So I've since uh, bastardized the wording of it. But the sh gist of what it was, was I want to provide whatever, God, this sounds so coincidental, like I'm just making it up. But I've, I, I, I said this a couple of years ago, like in film, whether it's film or TV or whatever I end up doing, I want to provide whatever that person needs at that time in their life that gave them whatever it gave them for that duration of time. If it gave them escape, great. If it gave them motivation, great. If it gave them humor or uh, inspiration for love or motivation to join the military, whatever that person needed. And if I can be that conduit towards that, that's, that's my reward. It, and then if I get, to, you know, Godspeed, do it as, as a job to put food on my table, that's, you know, the icing on the cake. And I always post this video and it's, it's really lovey dovey, but there's a video of a father with his little kid on his lap and they do a picture in picture of the kid. They show the footage of the kid is watching from the Superman movie, like the newer one. And you see the innocence of youth when the, when Superman flies for the first time, the kid, like this kid is probably not even a year old. And he got the concept of fantasy and, and like you could tell, like I'm getting the chills just thinking about it. And that I want to translate that to kids or adults. You know, I, I hope anybody listening to this has watched a movie 
or a TV show. And, and yeah, the grandiose swing for the fences is inspiration and motivation and go chase your dreams. That's awesome. But even if it's like, oh man, my relationship sucks, but this movie, you know, gave me some hope or made me realize what I can fix in my life or a kid watching Superman fly for the first time, whatever that is. And now in this coronavirus world, it's even more important to me that to do that. And hmm. even if it makes some kid go, I'm going to be a lawyer and a doctor and not some insane artistic artsy artsy actor. Great. You know, that's good too. You know? Yeah. And so, yeah, that's whatever I can provide at that time is how I, I look at it. I really that's passionate that, about it. I really want to win <laughs> No, that, that's such an important thing to recognize. Right. And I've been thinking about that with, uh, in terms of how many musicians we see now coming out and, and even amateur musicians just coming out yeah. and playing music and putting it on social media. Like oh God, yeah. we really need to pay attention to this as humanity. Uh, the fact yeah. that during these, these times where a lot of people are suffering, uh, the things that we turn to are culture again and yeah. music and, yeah. and, and yeah. art and, and we turn to, you know, Netflix and, and as much yeah. as, as it's really easy to, I guess, go down the rabbit hole of, you know, I look at all these lazy people watching Netflix and things. Well, you know what, at the end of the day, not everybody's going to pick up a book. Right. And a lot of people, uh, myself included with my wife, we love to just sit down and watch a funny show or something like that. It's such, there's such an importance of, uh, of when it's done right. uh, Content like that can be such a therapeutic uh, medium. Right. Um, And, could you imagine if we were in this situation and, you know, there was nothing to keep people preoccupied? I mean, we always used yeah. to read books and stuff like people have done yeah. it before, but, yeah. but you know, I think that it's yeah, pretty like good. The that internet we crashed this. during this, people would have to, res- would have to resort to books and, and talking, you know, if they could, you know, out of a window and yeah, it, it's terrifying to think about. Like, I mean, you saw that first footage of, I want to say it was Italy where people were singing in the balconies mm. and I, wouldn't in this current of state, I mean, obviously I, I highly believe a lot of Europe is much still more culturally connected, yeah. whether it's through Definitely. art or just, I mean, or just it's appreciation and it's saturation of culture. You know, I'm, I'm not knocking America, but it's, you, it took a while for some, <laughs> I think I want to say the next day, somebody posted a video of them in like California somewhere singing on their balcony and somebody yells, shut up. You know, that was like, that was very, that was very America, you know? Yeah. But I, I love that Italian video where it seemed like there was no age, no gender, no race that wasn't out on their balconies participating in that singing. And that mm-hmm. was really, I wouldn't have predicted that. I would have, I would have bet if somebody told me to bet which way or the other, I'd be like, no, they're all going to be inside watching Netflix, you know? And lo and behold, they still, they went back to the default of back in the day, people were, playing a wooden flute in the streets, you know, and yeah. at the end of the day, I think it's all, I mean, it bordering, it's all entertainment or, you know, and if it's an educational book, it's education, but it's all a form of entertainment. And uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's very odd. We're in a very odd time right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I agree. And maybe we'll, um, maybe we'll leave the conversation there with a bit of a cliffhanger for everyone that we're living in an odd time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and everyone just think about that but jeff uh yeah this is this has been an absolute pleasure man i'm, I'm excited to have you on many more times i think this has been such a great conversation oh, and to. i want to thank you for yeah. bringing your experience to the show oh i, I helping teacher relate makes me understand it better so i get a lot out of it i get probably more out of this than people hearing me ramble do so oh yeah that that's why i do it <laughs> yeah this is yeah, a purely exactly. selfish yeah, yeah. pursuit right because you learn <laughs> as you teach right and and yeah. um oh, yeah. and you know even jim, jim Rohn, one of my favorite uh, personal development leaders taught this yeah. he said you know if, if you share an idea 10 times the people you've shared it with have heard it once but you've heard it 10 times right so it's like why wouldn't you want yeah. to share that's as much brilliant. as possible? Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. We'll, we'll have you back. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, buddy. So there you have it, my interview with Jeff Bosley. Now, make sure you reach out to him online and let him know how much you appreciated him coming on the show. But I just had such a great time. I'm sure you guys got so much out of that like I did. And uh, we're going to have him back many more times. So... I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I'll talk to you next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. 
Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.